Let me touch briefly on each of the four priorities that I mentioned. If there's one issue that should keep us humble, it is the elusive quest for Arab-Israeli peace. While not a magic solution to all the many ills of the region, no other issue cuts closer to the core of what drives emotions throughout much of the Middle East. It is a truism that the parties themselves must make the difficult decisions for peace. And it is an historical fact that the biggest or most of the biggest breakthroughs from Sadat in Jerusalem to the secret negotiations in Oslo have come from the parties themselves. But persistent, hard-headed, day in and day out, high-level American engagement has also been a critical ingredient for success. From Henry Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy, to Jimmy Carter at Camp David, to Jim Baker on the road to Madrid. It is exactly that realization that has animated the efforts of President Obama, Secretary Clinton, and Senator Mitchell, appointed as the President's special envoy on the second day of the new administration. Our goal is clear. Two states living side by side in peace and security, a Jewish state of Israel with which America retains unbreakable bonds and with true security for all Israelis, and a viable independent Palestinian state with contiguous territory that ends the occupation that began in 1967, that ends the daily humiliations of Palestinians under occupation, and that realizes the full and remarkable potential of the Palestinian people. Toward that end, as Secretary Clinton emphasized last week in the region, we seek to relaunch direct negotiations without preconditions. That emphatically does not mean starting from scratch. It means building on previous agreements, resolving the core issues of the conflict, and settling it once and for all. At every step of this process, the United States will be an active and creative partner. We seek to create the best possible circumstances for negotiations, working with the parties, working with key regional partners like Egypt, and with the Quartet. We do not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. We consider the Israeli offer to restrain settlement activity to be a potentially important step, but it obviously falls short of the continuing roadmap obligation for a full settlement freeze. We seek to deepen international support for the Palestinian Authority's impressive plan to build over the next couple years uh, the institutions that a responsible Palestinian state requires. And we also seek progress toward peace between Israel and Syria and Israel and Lebanon as part of a broader peace among Israel and all of its neighbors. I wish I could stand before you today and point to substantial progress toward those goals. I cannot. But what I can say is that the administration's commitment and determination are undiminished and that we will continue to work hard to bring about the early resumption of negotiations, which is the only path to the two-state solution on which so much depends, not only for the future of Israelis and Palestinians, but for the entire Middle East. Setbacks and complications are the common thread that runs through every effort at Middle East peace. We need to learn from them, but not be deterred by them. We have made limited headway, a shared understanding between the parties about a two-state objective, a shared interest in moving back to the negotiating table, wide international backing for this process, steady progress in the face of very difficult odds toward shaping reliable Palestinian security organizations and governmental institutions in the West Bank. Now we need to bear down, move ahead, fulfill our responsibilities for leadership, and challenge every other party to fulfill theirs. Let me turn quickly to a second crucial issue, Iraq. Iraqis have come a long way from the ugly sectarian violence of 2006 and 2007, but their journey remains difficult and incomplete as they work toward the goal we all seek, a sovereign, self-reliant, and stable Iraq at peace with its neighbors. Progress in Iraq is obvious on many fronts. Last Saturday, Iraq's Council of Representatives passed a critically important elections law, paving the way for national elections in January. Prime Minister Maliki came to Washington last month to co-host an oversubscribed U.S.-Iraq business conference, which was followed by two major oil deals, a reminder of Iraq's enormous economic potential. At the same time, however, terrorist violence is a persistent threat, a reminder of all the work still to be done. 
The fact that these attacks, including bloody car bombs in the heart of Baghdad, have not reignited sectarian conflicts or undermined the institutions of government is a testament to the will of the vast majority of Iraqis who remain determined to build the normalcy that has so often been denied them in their tragic past. The United States will continue to stand firmly with Iraq in this hugely important effort. We will fulfill scrupulously our security and strategic framework agreements and have already begun the transition from a relationship focused on security issues to a civilian-led partnership increasingly based on cooperation in non-security areas, such as education, health, and economic ties. Meanwhile, we will continue to support Iraq's reintegration into its neighborhood. Iraq is now an active member of the GCC plus three group, which brings it together with Saudi Arabia and the other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, as well as Egypt and Jordan. Iraq's ties with Turkey have improved considerably in the last two years. Just last week, Egypt and Iraq launched a strategic cooperation framework similar to our own. None of us are naive about the problems that lie ahead for Iraq, and the United States will need to continue to focus intensive, high-level energy and attention on the future that Iraqis are trying to build for themselves. That future holds growing promise, and we would be foolish to lose sight of its significance. A third challenge before us is the difficult question of Iran. As all of you know very well, this conference falls almost exactly 30 years after one of the most painful and shameful episodes in the often turbulent relationship between our two countries. The seizure of the US Embassy in Tehran deeply affected the lives of the courageous Americans who were unjustly held hostage for some 14 months. And we owe each of them and their families an enormous debt of gratitude for their extraordinary service and sacrifice. This anniversary is a vivid reminder that the hostility between our governments has cost both our nations dearly. To be sure, Iranians have their own list of grievances. But the question before us is whether we can move beyond this troubled past and seek to ensure that the antagonisms and suspicions of our past do not define the future for America and Iran. President Obama has made clear that the United States, for our part, wants to look ahead. We seek a relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran based upon mutual interest and mutual respect. We do not seek regime change. We have condemned terrorist attacks against Iran. We have recognized Iran's international right to peaceful nuclear power. With our partners in the international community, we have demonstrated our willingness to take creative confidence-building steps, including our support for the IAEA's offer of fuel for the Tehran Research Reactor. With our partners in the international community, we are ready for a serious dialogue with Iran about how it can resolve long-standing doubts about the exclusively peaceful nature of its nuclear ambitions, doubts only reinforced by the recent revelation of a clandestine enrichment facility near Qom. With our partners in the international community, we are ready to move with Iran along a pathway of cooperation, not confrontation, of integration, not animosity. But that depends squarely on the choices that Iran makes, on its willingness to meet its international obligations and responsibilities.